This is the TSR2, and to be fair, it's probably one of the most requested aircraft I get asked about. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick overview, because I haven't got a whole lot of time, but I can do a quick outline of this aircraft. But to be honest, it's not one of my favorite aircraft, and I know that's part one of what's gonna cause controversy, but also, it looks like something that was designed by somebody who watched too much Thunderbirds. And frankly, International Rescue was rubbish. I didn't like that TV show. Um, it's raved about and has a massive fan base, and I think it's garbage. And I know that's gonna like cause half my audience to rage quit immediately, mostly the half that likes this aircraft. But that said, there's nothing wrong particularly with this aircraft. So I'm gonna do a little overview of why this never came about. But this was kind of almost touted to be the British version of the SR-71. Not as advanced for reasons we'll get into, but not far off. That's kind of where it was going. So anyway, let's dig into it a bit. So first, let's get into why it's called a TSR-2. Um, there is no TSR-1. Reason is this, it's TSR-2, which stands for Tactical Strategic, no, uh, tra Tactical Strike Reconnaissance Mark II. So it's a tactical strike aircraft that's also a reconnaissance aircraft that can travel at Mark II plus, And that's basically what forms the name of it. So no TSR-1, it's just, that's what it's called, TSR-2. I don't know, I quite like its good name. So why did the TSR2 end up being a museum piece instead of being like an example of fine British engineering and uh, you know, a world beating aircraft? Well, the thing is, it's not actually down to the aircraft itself failing particularly, it's more about politics that we'll get into in a bit. But this thing was designed basically because at the time we had the Canberra, which was doing the um, surveillance and electronic warfare role, and this was supposed to replace it because the thinking at the time was the the, the Canberra was going to get taken out by MiG-15s and other Soviet strike aircraft. Originally, it used to fly high and it used to get over the top of flak and all that kind of thing, and they thought nothing could reach out and touch it, but then MiG-15s turned up and that, that kind of dream faded. But it turned out the Canberra had a much longer lifespan in it than anyone expected, but that's a whole other story to deal with with the Canberra. But this was supposed to replace that by being able to fly at Mach 2 and above, so it could outpace anything the Russians had and fly high, while at the same time having a whole suite of electronics for warfare and radar and so on that it could then utilize in the surveillance role. And then the flip side of that, it was supposed to be able to fly at Mach 1.5 at pretty much ground level and do strike roles from that kind of position and do bombing with both conventional and nuclear arms. And that ended up being done by the Buccaneer not necessarily because this wasn't up to the job, but just because of the way the politics played out and because the Buccaneer turned up. It turned out that was just a much better airframe to do that role, and ironically proved the point that actually a subsonic aircraft was perfectly capable and perfectly relevant, even in a modern, well, you know, in the, 90, uh, uh, the 20th century battlefield, it was still a very relevant aircraft. But that's not to say that this thing would have failed in those roles. It was actually something else that sculled it. But let's get into some of the technical sides of this that actually make it such a good idea, at least. Now, first things first, I said that this aircraft would do Mach 2.35. That's actually in what they call a dash mode, which means that it can do that, but not for a sustained period. But it could do Mach, Mach, about Mach 2.05 for a sustained length of time, up to 50,000 feet. And the way it could achieve that was these dirty, great big Olympus engines. Now, this is just the reheat section of an Olympus. You can see the engines missing from down that end. But it means you can actually, I don't know if you'll see it on the camera that well, but you can actually see the, um, the, the fuel injector and all the rest of it that's part of the reheat process. These were what were then developed and then put onto Concorde, which made that aircraft do Mach 2, except that had four of them and this only had two of them. But these engines are incredible. They're so powerful. And it was a turbofan design that then took this thing up to about Mach 2.35. And the reason that it doesn't go faster than that is partly because that's about the extent of these engines, but also at around about 2.35, the leading edge temperature of the wings and of other bits of the aircraft gets so hot that it starts to buckle. And then you get to the point where the aircraft can start falling apart, which it is not a good design feature. But that's why the SR-71, although it's only about what 0.75 of a Mach above this, that's why it takes so much more engineering to get there, because as soon as you get into that point of reaching hypersonic speed, everything gets really hot and difficult and awkward. So 
But yeah, you know, Mach 2.35 in a dash meant that there was pretty much nothing the Russians had until maybe the, I don't know, I'd have to look up the numbers, maybe the, the MiG-25, the Foxbat, but nothing could touch it. And a lot of missiles couldn't touch it because by the time they got to where it was, it was now somewhere else. Now it comes down to the argument of what was it that actually failed this aircraft into, and meant that it never became a, a production model. Well, there's two arguments. One is that it technically wasn't up to it, and there's people who will argue that it was just a big technical white elephant. And then there's the side of it that says that it was all to do with politics. And that's the side that I think is the real reason. Because ultimately, there was problems with this. The landing gear had huge amounts of issues with vibration. They ended up having to add to what was already a complicated landing strut and wheel assembly they had to add extra tie struts and all sorts of other things to stabilize it and make it so it wouldn't like come apart on top of that there was issues with the fuel pumps because the fuel pumps would hit a resonant frequency of the eyeballs and they would literally blind the pilot as they pushed through the certain speed ranges because the fuel pumps would be vibrating vibrating the aircraft and making the pilot incapable of seeing um, so there was a few things, but the thing is, every aircraft has these problems. There are a whole bunch of aircraft in this museum that are considered icons, and all of them went through issues. Or some of them had their issues that stayed with them through their whole service life. So I don't really believe that little things like the landing gear having issues and whatever else, you know. Ultimately, the people who did get to fly this, I mean, some of them described it as flying a giant lightning, but the people who flew it said it flew incredibly well. And... That kind of leads me to believe that ultimately it would have been a very serviceable aircraft. The reason the politics let it down was because right back in the start of development, I'll try and make this as small as possible because that's a whole half hour thing, but right back at the start, they amalgamated a bunch of companies into BAC, but not all of them. So what you ended up with was one parent company who were developing this aircraft and then a bunch of satellite companies who weren't reporting to that parent company, BAC, they were reporting into the Ministry of Defense, as were BAC, which meant that communication was awful and that led to project overruns, time overruns, project overruns on cost. Um, the whole thing just kind of fell apart. And on top of that, the political will and belief at the time was that strategic strike capability should really become the domain of missiles because aircraft were vulnerable to surface-to-air missiles and to interceptors and all that kind of thing, which meant that having strategic bombers was becoming less of a viable option when having something like nuclear missiles was a more kind of viable way of delivering mega flashbangs. So... There was a lot more to it than that in terms of the politics, but ultimately the, it, the whole thing just turned into an absolute, um, I can't think of the word without swearing, but it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. But that's what killed it. It wasn't the technology. It was just simply that the political will to make what was at the time a £16 million per aircraft deal. And that was a lot of money back then. Um, but to make an aircraft that cost £16 million a piece and the fact that the production line was absolutely a nightmare because of all these disparate and disconnected companies and rivalries and everything else that's what got it but before we get into the final word i'm just going to say something about something on the other side of the aircraft now looking into this open bay full of bits and pieces you can see that one thing this aircraft was packed with was avionics gear and equipment and in some ways arguably this is the legacy of this aircraft that a lot of the things and features that this aircraft had, like side-looking radar and ground-following radar and various other av avionic advancements, a lot of that was in nothing else. Not any other country in the world, nowhere else had it. And admittedly, they didn't make it work particularly well in this one, but the concept was kind of proved by this, and it went on to be in a lot of future aircraft. So you could say that this kind of paved the way for a lot of those aircraft. Um, and the idea was that this took a lot of the load off the pilot and off the crew so you could have less crew in the aircraft and you could then be more successful in your mission outcomes. So it's not as if it hasn't had any kind of like rollover into the future. But, you know, I'm going to have to look at my notes because I've got a closing statement and I'm going to have to try and remember it. So in the end, I side with the people who think that this was a technically brilliant aircraft that could have been something incredible and was killed by politics. And it was Sir Sidney Cam, the quote that I had to look up because I'm not going to memorise everything. Couldn't remember his name. But anyway, Sir Sidney Cam, who was, I think it was Hawker Sidley used to originally work for as a designer, he said aircraft basically have four dimensions. They have width, breadth, height and politics. 
and he said that it, this aircraft exceeded in three out of four of those things. Basically, it was a brilliant aircraft that was screwed over by politics and by bureaucracy, which unfortunately is something that happens with a lot of aircraft designs.